All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Um, everyone, we are so happy to have you and thank you in advance for attending our session today, which is focused on collaborative care foundations and is a 101 primer on practice and possibilities. Next slide, please. My name is Shannon Lee, and I am a Senior Program Manager at PCDC, and excited to be here with you all today. Next slide. So for those of you who are not familiar with PCDC and are new um, to our series, we were founded in 1993 as a nonprofit that was dedicated to expanding and transforming primary care in underserved communities to improve health outcomes, lower health costs, and reduce disparities. And I am going to read this disclaimer word for word. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, CMHS, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. Next slide, please. So I just want to bring you um, bring your attention to this tip sheet that's here. In our last session, Mitigating Burnout Through Integrated Healthcare, expert presenters discussed the state of our providers and presented a real world case study on how operationalizing integration methodologies of collaboration and communication benefited one healthcare team. So if you missed the webinar and you want to review a few key takeaways, check out our tip sheet for practical information and actions that you can take to mitigate burnout through integrated healthcare. Next slide, please. I'd also like to highlight our Integration at Work SAMHSA webinar series tip sheets. Held last year, the series provided a roadmap for behavioral and primary care collaboration. So all recordings and tip sheets from Integration at Work can be accessed by, by following the link shown here. And as an FYI, today's slides and recordings will be sent out next week. So you will have access to all of the tip sheet links. So before um, introducing our speaker, I would like to get to know a little bit more about you. So if you could take a second to let us know where you work, um, your primary role and how you would rate your current skills and comfort with the evidence base for collaborative care, typical collaborative care tasks and team roles and the principles of collaborative care. And just as a reminder, at the end of this presentation, we will transition into our half hour open office hour session. So the slides and recordings again will be made available next week. And if you do not see yourself on this particular poll, please drop in the chat. Um, where you're from, you know, what type of setting you work in, and um, your primary role. Okay, we have some psychologists in integrated primary care from Philadelphia. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. We're super excited, like I said previously, to have you. Okay, we have someone from North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, awesome. Hmm. Okay, next slide, Dr. Kern. So I am excited to introduce Dr. Kern today. Dr. Kern serves as clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington. His work focuses on training and implementation of the collaborative care model, as well as the implementation of team-based data-driven services to improve disparities in healthcare for people living with serious mental illness. For 22 years, Dr. Kern was the chief medical officer at Regional Mental Health Center in Merrillville, Indiana, where he has since 2007 developed and supervised several integrated integration programs both providing collaborative care in the FQHC setting and providing primary care support for a seriously mental, mentally ill population. As part of his work, he developed and served as chief medical officer of a new federally qualified health center merged with the CMHC. 
He is one of the authors of two American Psychiatric Press textbooks and the American Academy of Community Psychiatry textbook on integrated care for psychiatrists. He has published on the care of bipolar disorder in the primary care setting and on improving the quality of community psychiatric care. Other interests include the expansion of scope of the collaborative care model, innovations directed towards improving the psychiatric workplace and improving the effectiveness of instruction provided to practitioners of collaborative care. Welcome, Dr. Kern. And for those that are still joining, thank you for coming. And Dr. Kern, I will now pass it along to you. Thanks very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. I think I actually recommend or uh, recognize a couple of folks. So that's uh, nice to see you again. Um, I've been asked uh, by um, the folks at PCDC to, to do a um, review, kind of a one-on-one on collaborative care and, and, and with some thoughts about how this applies to present day um, practice situations. And uh, in, in particular, as has always been the case, the need for uh, improved access to mental health services, uh, for which I think it is probably the, the uh, core intervention. And so uh, we'll be talking for about the next uh, 15 minutes about how this is set up and how it works. And, um, and hopefully this will be helpful in guiding you toward the kind of um, involvement with uh, collaborative care you may be interested in doing. I wanted to say right off the top that collaborative care um, in this setting and the way it's used at University of Washington and the way it's used actually in the medical literature refers not just to all kinds of care that in which people collaborate, but to a specific form of team-based, um, measurement-based, mental health care provided in primary care settings. And so um, just sometimes that's a little obscure, but I just wanted, for the purposes of this presentation, that's what we're talking about. Now, not, that's not to say that other forms of collaboration are not valuable and worthwhile, of course they are, um, but this, this conversation is focused specifically on this particular very well-studied version of providing primary care, or behavioral health in primary care settings. Okay, that clarified, let's move forward to the learning objectives. Um, at the end of this session, uh, my goal is that participants should be able to understand the evidence base for collaborative care, which is pretty significant. Describe typical collaborative care tasks and team roles. So this is, a, this is an activity that is done by a team and who and where the tasks are divided up <laughs> and um, and talk about the five basic principles of collaborative care, um, which we'll talk more about um, as we go. OK. Who gets treatment? This slide could also be entitled, Why Bother Doing Collaborative Care? And the short answer is, um, there's not adequate access to a mental health treatment in the United States or anywhere, really, but certainly in the United States. Um, this is a slide we've been using for a while. This And cl clearly, this has been um, made much worse during COVID or much more publicly um, recognized. And so, but even before COVID, um, probably amongst all patients who could be identified with a diagnosable mental health or substance abuse disorder, only about four in 10 received any treatment. So if these 10 stock photos represent um, all of the people with a diagnosable mental health or substance use disorder in the United States, you can see that the six on the left um, get no treatment at all. And of those who do get treatment, um, at least half of them and probably more, uh, get it in a primary care setting, usually not in a very organized way, um, and usually um, not in a terribly effective way. And uh, sadly, the evidence is that in primary care settings, try, try as they might, um, the re response rate to treatment for uh, depression is really not different from um, the spontaneous remission without treatment. 
Um, and so that even though there's been efforts made over the decades to try and improve the care in, in primary care settings in traditional settings, um, is that's just not been that's just not been effective. Um, <clears throat> about two in ten saw any mental health professional. Um, and of those, uh, less uh, only about 12 percent um, of the whole group saw a psychiatrist. So um, in the, the long and short of it is that mental health providers are only touching a small percentage of the total number of people who are suffering from mental health disorders. And so anytime you pick up a, a paper or look at a website, you hear a, a litany, a list of depressing statistics about lack of access. And those statistics are pointed in the right direction for sure. So if you are a primary care provider, um, and, and actually this whole presentation is kind of aimed at people who are in primary care, working in primary care, and, and thinking about how to address the uh, the demand that they have from their patients presenting with the mental health complaints. Um, the first, the first impulse that one generally has is to refer, like you would do if somebody came in with uh, multiple sclerosis and you refer them to a neurologist, for example. Um, and um, so, if you're working in a primary care setting, that's part of your that's part of your job to 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 do. Uh, population-based health and to, when necessary, refer to specialty care. And so it's not surprising or abnormal or wrong um, to have that impulse. The problem is that it doesn't work. Um, even in situations where there is adequate access in the community to, to for example, psychiatrists or to psychiatric providers, about half of patients who are referred for specialty services do not reach the specialists. And those that do average, it's actually less than two visits. Yeah, I have, I have uh, data from this over 20 years in my large uh, mental health organization where we ran both the collaborative care program on the behavior on the primary care site and then the specialty mental health program. And we would refer to ourselves and we would do things like get the intake into the mental health system taken care of, and um, do any, everything we could think of to lower the barrier to this transition to specialty care. And after years of focused effort and QI, QI projects, uh, what we ended up with was about 20% um, uptake of referrals. Um, and so that was from us to us um, in a situation where we've been working hard to improve that number. So it's it's hard to do, and so why why is that? Um, patients in general tend not to follow through on referrals, even when they do, they don't come much, and and so why not? So there's the stigma of going to a specialty clinic. We have a lot of patients who say, "I don't really mind coming to see to talk to the behavioral health provider in the same place where I see my doctor for my cholesterol, but I'm not parking my truck." in the parking lot of that other place, someone might see me. Um, and so that, you know, so folks tended to not be comfortable going to, you know, what they used to call in my neighborhood, the crazy house. Um, so that's, that's a real, that's a real obstacle to, to, uh, to specialty services. Okay. So given that there's this access problem, Given that there is um, relatively small capacity for uptake of psychiatric patients, and given that probably the process of improving access is going to involve something that involves or takes place in the, the primary care setting, or at least partially takes place in the primary care setting, there's a, there is a notion called stepped care. And the idea of stepped care is that there is a, an array of kinds of services directed at kinds of clinical situations. And that the, the point would be to match those up to, to, if you have a situation that would respond to a relatively straightforward intervention, 
to do that. And in situations where it, the problems are more complex or more refractory to treatment or more resources are expected to be needed to do that. There is in the mental health system, um, the community mental health system, this, in other words, the system devoted to the ongoing care of people with severe and persistent mental illness, um, a, a lot of incentives or requirements to do rather elaborate intake, for example. And so if you are a certified community mental health center in many states, um, you have pages and pages and pages of information that your accrediting body requires you to get to, to initiate services, um, including for somebody who may have, a, for example, a relatively straightforward depression that would respond to a, maybe a brief psychotherapy or maybe a brief course of antidepressant medication. Um, and, and so what tends to happen is if you're up at the top of this pyramid, uh, you find that you are using a lot of resources um, in a place where it's not needed. Um, and that means that there's less resources for those people who really need it. And so the idea of this of this pyramid is to match, is to be more efficient, be able to treat more people effectively by matching the level of intervention to the level of uh, the clinic, to the level of complexity or difficulty of the clinical situation. And so, um, so just to step through it, at the bottom, there are patients who are mostly managed by the primary care provider without additional support need. These may be these may be people who don't actually meet criteria for a mental health diagnosis. They may be people having an adjustment problem. They may be people experiencing di uh, distress for one reason or another, and um, or they may be people with relatively straight, depending on the primary care provider, with relatively straightforward depression or anxiety or or, or the like, who um, for whom for example, uh, antidepressant medicine might be prescribed. Uh, some primary care providers are very comfortable with this and they see this as part of their mission um, for their for their caseload, and some don't. But uh, but uh, but a lot, but you know, the majority of psychotropics are prescribed in this way. So a lot of people, at least in some way, either figure that this is their this is their business or that uh, they have no choice. And, and, and in many, 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 many jurisdictions, they have no choice. There is just no access of any kind or very limited access to, um, to mental health services. And this is true, not to beat this to death, but this is true everywhere. And so you would think, for example, in Seattle, um, a, um, you know, a relatively enlightened um, urban place with lots of resources and money, that you could track down a psychiatrist if you needed one. Well, good luck. Um, and certainly, if you are in a rural setting, um, it's it's also very difficult to access access services. So, it, it, so like I said, often primary care providers feel they have no choice. Um, the next the next step up is uh, what we call primary care panel management. So, this would be. Um, a situation where maybe the clinic has a, a setup where they do systematic screening for depression and anxiety. You come into the office and they give you, you know, they give you that um, clipboard with all those papers on it and they ask you about your allergies and, um, and but they also ask you about uh, questions about depression and they give you a PHQ-9 and, and the like. And then if you light up those kinds of screenings and they follow up, they say, let's talk more about that. And there might be there might be a, a a behavioral health provider of some kind based in the practice for handoff for cases that are identified either by this kind of screening or in the process of the primary care provider's appointment. So someone some people are shy about screening and they don't want to fill it out or they don't really fill it out accurately because you know whose business is it. And then they go to the they go to their doc who they trust and they say uh, you know I I'm feeling terrible. And then, and then, so that's another way of case finding, and that's another way where the person can enter into care that's provided in a primary care setting. The next step above is what we call collaborative care, and so, <laughs> and so, this whole lecture is about this one slice of the cake. Um, this is a um, pyramid-shaped cake, or you could look at it as a flat piece of pie that we've got the the middle part of. But in any case. Um, this is what I'm going to be talking about. This is a specific approach 
using a, a practice base. In other words, somebody usually in the clinic, but these days sometimes not infrequently remote. Um, so that's a behavioral health provider who's available to work face-to-face, -face, so to speak, um, with um, individuals who are referred. And then there's a, a psychiatric consultant. Um, there's there's a person like me, it could be a psychiatrist, it could be a, some other kind of um, psychiatric provider, like a nurse practitioner or a psych PA, who is available to hear cases and consult on them and make recommendations about treatment. And it turns out, we'll talk much more about the details, but it turns out that that works quite well. And that work, that's for a group of patients who aren't uh, responsive or amenable to the most sort of basic, straightforward um, interventions in the lower parts of the, the piece of pie or pyramid. Now, there has been, when I, when I first started teaching people about this years ago, there was a lot of concern that, that psychiatric practice writ large would devolve to this and there would be no more room for specialty health care. In other words, this is like the, the province of people in, in private practice, as well as in um, public mental health departments, facilities, um, agencies that provide, that hold themselves out to be providing care for people with psychiatric disorders or with substance use disorders. And of course, of course, that's not going away. Um, there's lots of things, lots and lots of things that we that are not appropriately treated, that were the, the appropriate amount of support and uh, support for recovery um, is not available in, in a collaborative care setting. So especially behavioral health, I've actually you know made most of my career in specialty behavioral health, and I continue actually to work in specialty behavioral health, um, both as, as a psychiatric consultant to a program that I set up nine years ago, and as faculty to a residency that we run in uh, in Northwest Indiana for in a specialty behavioral health care center. So that's that's not going away and there's still a place. So these are the folks, for example, who have schizophrenia, they have uh, severe affective disorders, they have severe personality disorders. Um, in, some, in some places, this is all tied up with the uh, folks with intellectual disability. So this is, there's lots to do here and there's no intention here that this would um, be demoted or taken away. Um, I'll just draw attention to this line between the, the dark blue collaborative care slice and especially behavior, behavioral slice. And this, and this marks the difference between you know, where the patient is in the, in the two clubs, got carried away here, within the two systems. Um, and last but not least, there are still people who need inpatient behavioral health care. Not, there aren't so many places as there used to be in philosophy about the appropriateness of this um, is varies. And of course, this is another desperate shortage area, which deserves its own series of lectures. Okay, having beaten to death this piece of pie, what I'm gonna do now for the next probably 20 minutes is talk nuts and bolts about how this slice, oops, how this slice works, how this collaborative care slice works, um, and exactly how you do it. <clears throat> and there's a lot to say. So let's let's do it. The collaborative care model is a is uh, a way of providing care that is, for all intents and purposes, let's say in the plain vanilla version, located in the in a primary care setting, and it, it involves a team. Um, the, the the care of these folks is um, divided up into a, a team. Um, this systematic approach. Um, is uh, was first demonstrated in what's called the impact model, uh, which was uh, the studies of which were initially published in 2002. So this has been pretty much the state of the art for over 20 years. Um, so collaborative care starts with a primary care practice that has integrated a behavioral health care manager. This is a person who has the most patient facing um, mental health role. And, and an act, hopefully an active and informed patient who has been engaged and talked to about, uh, talked with about um, how we might be able to help them in this way. There's the regular use of outcome measures. So we use, for example, the, the well-known infamous PHQ-9 and the GAD-7, and then other measures, the PCL-5 for PTSD, 
Uh, we use other kinds of um, screening measures such as the CIDA3 for bipolar disorder. But the idea is that we get this kind of measurement regularly like you would get blood pressure measurements regularly for somebody whose blood pressure you were treating or you would get um, you know, blood sugar measurements or you would get peak flows for somebody with asthma to assess how the treatment was working out. This use of outcome measures has been the source of much discussion. Um, and again, I've been, I was, I've been accused of uh, reducing psychiatric assessment and diagnosis to the use of a rating scale. Um, I would posit that that's not really the case. The idea is that when you're taking care of a large population of people, this gives you a first order idea of how folks are doing to be followed up on. And so a PHQ score, high or low, is the beginning of a conversation and not the end of a conversation. You know, about 80, I would say 80, 85% of patients, it's real useful and it reflects clinical reality. And in some patients, it doesn't. And some patients put all zeros or they put all threes or they make an airplane out of it. And so for those patients, it's not that useful. And you carry on your work without the benefit of that measurement, but it's still worth doing because of its usefulness in the majority of the patients who we care for in primary care. And it's there's a, there's a really interesting and robust uh, body of evidence that even that in, even in non-collaborative care settings, for example, in the strictly medication-based treatment of depression, the use of outcome measures, the use of measurement-based care improves outcomes significantly. So this is not just a creature of collaborative care. This is a pretty well-defined principle for effect, for improving the effectiveness of of treatment for depression or for the, all the things we take care of here. Uh, we, we use a registry, uh, which is basically a kind of a database that has pay in patient information about you know, who you're dealing with and when you've seen them and how well they're doing or how poorly or if they're improving you know, using, using the rating scale scores. And uh, when, if ever, they have had a, a psychiatric consultation. And the use of a, such a registry has been clearly demonstrated to be associated with significantly improved response to the treatment of depression in uh, primary care-based depression care, um, and sometimes uh, as much as, as twice as, as twice as effective. So that's um, that's a core activity. This is something when we support implementations, um, this is invariant. We always recommend this. It always has been shown to make a significant difference. And what you find is there's a difference between what happens when you use a registry, you're reminded of folks who otherwise you would forget about. People in, in, in most mental health settings, I will speak for the one in which I used to work and now I work again, um, you are preoccupied with the fire hose of demand that is appearing at your door. You have plenty to occupy yourself with, with just people coming to see you every day. And when you think about all the people for whom you have as, assumed clinical responsibility, some of them don't come immediately to mind when you're very, very busy. And what a registry does is when you have a systematic way of approaching how you're taking care of folks is it reminds you that there are people who either you haven't seen in a while and are risk of falling through the cracks or who you have been seeing. And by golly, they're not getting better. And you need to do something. You need to act on that to in a timely way to get things moving in the right direction for them. And um, this, this idea of prescribing a, an evidence-based treatment, measuring how it's going, and on a timely basis, assessing and doing the next thing if you need to do it, this is, in my opinion, one of the core activities that makes the difference between collaborative care and between treatment as usual, and but in some other forms of primary care-based behavioral health. It really keeps you focused on moving folks through the, the, the several adjustments in treatment, either psychotherapeutically in terms of the psychotherapeutic approach or in terms of the medication approach that are needed if folks are gonna get better. Usually the first thing you do doesn't work. And, and usually the second thing you do doesn't work. And so you have to stay at it and you have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it 
And what we like to say is that um, the secret is to secret to effective treatment is doing simple things well. And it really, and it really is. Oh, Kidoki. Um, just a couple other things. Um, there are, there's, we focus um, once you're actually at the point of you've identified the patient, you're tracking how they're doing. What are you doing with them? Well, you're you're providing evidence. What we have shown to be evidence-based approaches. So evidence-based approach to medications, uh, following the literature about the best way of, for example, treating depression or anxiety and the like with uh, medications, um, and the use of brief behavioral interventions that have been shown to be really effective in the treatment of depression in the primary care setting. So we're talking about behavioral activation. We're talking about problem solving therapy. We train up our care managers to do these kinds of brief interventions and they are really effective. Um, and in some, in many settings as effective as what are often thought of as more definitive um, psychotherapeutic approaches to depression. And, the, and, and when you're thinking about our old pyramid and, and about applying relatively straightforward approaches to people with relatively straightforward problems, this is a situation where you have someone quickly identified, provided a brief therapy that's, that's, not, that's shown to be effective and responding. And so you've used relatively few of your limited array of resources to get that person better. And so it's not like they needed more, they got them better. And so it's, a, it's you know, so we have kind of two hats on at the same time. We're thinking about getting the individual better, that's important. But we're also thinking about how do we marshal our resources as a mental health system or as a medical system that has responsibility for behavioral health to, to most efficiently get as many people taken care of and better as we can. Um, last but not least, as part of the collaborative care model is the um, systematic caseload review with the psychiatric consultant. And this is basically, this is my old colleague, uh, Mark Avery, formerly at the University of Washington. And he's sitting in front of a, he's sitting in front of, oops, sorry about that. He's sitting in front of a registry like this one, and he's talking with the care manager and they're going through the cases, looking at who's getting better, who's not getting better and focusing attention on those people who need our care the most. Someone's on autopilot and they're getting better. They don't need us to be talking about them. We need to be talking about the people who need adjustments to the treatment or clarifications of their diagnosis, et cetera. Okay, so I, I painted you a picture of what's a pretty complicated model with a fair number of moving parts. And if you've been involved with this before, you know that there are a lot of moving parts. And so this is the these are some of the challenges with implementation to get all of these things set up and going. Of course, you can't do it. You can, I said can do it, um, but uh, it uh, it's, uh, requires a thoughtful process. Um, why would you go to all that trouble though? Well. One reason you might go to all that trouble is that it works. Um, the first demonstration of this was in the IMPACT trial, which is a trial of, of, of well over, um, I think almost 2,000 patients um, done in the late 90s in a uh, geriatric population. Um, and what basically was shown there, I will show you in a minute, uh, it, but it was followed up by more than 90, and now way more than 90 randomized controlled trials showing that collaborative care is more effective than usual care. And this link here is to our website at the Ames Center at the University of Washington um, that discusses uh, the evidence base for this, this um, form of treatment. These are the outcomes for the initial impact study. So there were eight healthcare organizations that were involved in this study. And many of them already had practice-based behavioral health of some kind or another. And, um, and, in, and yet, when the whole model of collaborative care was put in place, um, about twice as many patients improved. And so these are the, these are the rates, uh, the, the y-axis is the percentage of patients who had 50% or greater improvement in depression at 12 months. And you can see it's pretty, it's a pretty robust um, 
it's a pretty robust response. And the, and the statistics, you know, it looks like that visually, but the statistics bear it out. Um, so um, let's see here. Let's move along from that. There we go. Um, what we found in more recent years is there have been questions about, you know, does this work in um, in a different populations? The initial um, impact population was uh, was largely white, and um, what we found is that um, the improvement in depression at 12 months using the the well, actually this is impact data. Um, is is good. It's good. It seems to be it seems to be quite useful in in underserved populations. And a lot of the implementations certainly that I've worked on in the last several years have been in in those kinds of uh, communities. Um, this is data having to do with how it is for patients and providers to receive this care. And so, do folks like to get their mental health service or their mental health issues um, uh, responded to in a primary care setting. Generally, they do. Um, and do, do the providers find this help makes their life easier? It's very stressful to be a primary care provider and to be faced with responsibility without much help for things that you don't feel well prepared to take care of. That is to say, behavioral health conditions. And, um, and so the idea here is if you bring in help, if you bring in a, a behavioral health care manager, if you bring in a consultant psychiatrist, that should take some of the load off. And that's generally what's reported. The, um, the flip side of this, which bears pointing out, is that the primary care provider is asked or tasked, might be a better word, in the collaborative care model with being part of the team. It's not a handoff, it's not a referral out. You're part of the team. And so for example, let's say a patient comes in and we assess them with depression and they start getting behavioral activation and it's, they're but it's not working and the patient's not getting better and they get prescribed an antidepressant medication or they get recommended the use of an antidepressant medication by the psychiatric consultant. Um, that recommendation goes to the primary care provider. It's still their patient. They're still the doc for that patient. They're still the provider for that patient. And it's their responsibility, for example, to write the antidepressant prescription. And so they're involved in that way, <clears throat> among, amongst other ways, and not least of which is the importance of them putting their very important opinion and their weight um, behind the provision of this team-based care to say, in essence, to the patient, I value this, I'm down with this, these are good people, I trust them, they work with me, um, this is likely to be helpful, as opposed to something like, oh, I guess I'll send you to see, I'll refer you to see those mental health people. Um, it makes a huge difference that the, the patients or the consumers' perception of whether their primary care provider thinks this is of, of value. And so that's a that's a super important part. But there's also sort of everyday clinical responsibility, like the prescribing and the monitoring of of medication. So that is that is a thing. Um, it's not it's not all um, it's not all just like I'm I've got people to dump this problem off on. The primary care provider remains an important part of the team. Um, and so as we train people, we feel that it's important to uh, to engage. And, and make sure our primary care colleagues understand how critical and how important their role in it is. But in, for example, in this study um, published in 2005, it's with, from, with data from the impact, the regional impact study, um, at 12 months, primary care providers reported significantly higher satisfaction with collaborative care as compared with usual care. You may find in situations, for example, in high powered academic settings, where there is actual access to a referral out to, to specialty psychiatry settings that folks may still want to do this. And so this is a this is this can be an issue in you know, implementation. Collaborative care has been studied for a, for an expanding array of behavioral health conditions. It's and this is of special interest to me. 
you know, we initially start with depression and anxiety, but you know, people just don't walk in with, <laughs> with depression and anxiety. They walk in with everything. And uh, people come, people come to the uh, primary care doc, they come to see their provider when they don't feel well with whatever it happens to be. And they're often not terribly, they often been, haven't been reading the literature about what they ought to go, where they ought to go for what. And um, years ago, when I was running a, a, a program, a collaborative care program, patients would come in and they had bipolar disorder and they'd come in and they'd say, hey, doc, I'm here because I want to continue on my Depakote that I used to, that I have been taking over the years for my bipolar disorder. And they would, they would come to see us and we'd ask them, did you know we have this special program here? And they'd say, no, I did, I felt bad. I went to the doctor. And so um, in, in ideally in the initial kind of manifestation of the collaborative care model, people would, um, you know, people would try and limit. They'd say, what's, a, what's an appropriate referral? What do we have an evidence base for? Well, it was depression, anxiety, and all these other things, PTSD, chronic pain, dementia, substance use, bipolar disorder. Um, we, we didn't have any experience. We hadn't studied it. We didn't know. But when you're out, as I was, I've been at the University of Washington for about seven years. But prior to that, I was in the community for decades and running one of these programs. And people would come in with everything, and including bipolar disorder. And, and um, we'd see lots and lots and lots of people with bipolar disorder. And sometimes sometimes we could refer to ourselves. But you remember from like slide three, 20% of them took and 80% of them didn't. And often they would come back and they say, I want to be treated here. And the take home message is you can do this. Collaborative care works for these things. And the um, I don't think it's in this slide set. But for example, for bipolar disorder, um, UW completed in the last couple of years, a giant study of with an N of over a thousand of the care of people with bipolar disorder and PTSD in rural federally qualified health centers. And it was robustly effective. And, um, and um, it was just as effective as the care in a traditional face-to-face -face way with a psychiatrist and psychologist. And, um, and the uh, effect size, the effectiveness of the treatment was very high. And so it was a robust demonstration that you can do this. And it's not the first thing you do. And it's not, you can't do it without preparation. But the point is that this collaborative care model, and, um, and I'm going to describe what it is that would define a collaborative care model in a, me, in a minute, can be applied to quite a wide array of clinical problems or of psychiatric or mental health problems um, effectively. And uh, you know, the, the, and so the, the point is that this this um, literature has been developing over over the last couple of decades and continues to be promising in, in a lot of ways. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about now is what we call the principles of collaborative care. Now, whenever I see this, when I see this principle thing, um, I always think you know it reminds me of like when you're in college and you get the textbook and it says principles of organic chemistry and you go oh no principle is bad. But the idea here is there are certain characteristics of treatment programs that we think um, reflect collaborative care and the thing they're they're the things that make collaborative care go. They're the things that make it work, and it's our belief that. If you develop a program, a behavioral health and primary care program, and you want it to succeed, it's our feeling that it should have these characteristics. Now, collaborative care is not a religion, and it's not a franchise, and no one's making you do any of those things. So it's not unusual for me to be asked, do I have to do this, or am I allowed to do that? And the answer is, it's your program. You can do what you want. But if you want it to be to, to succeed, you may want to think hard about whether you can do some of these things and whether the program you want to set up will succeed if you don't do these things. So I'm just going to step through them really quickly, which five of them. Um, oops, that was too quickly. OK, uh, first is patient centered team. So the idea here is that it's a team. So we talked about this, a primary care providers, the mental health providers, both the, the behavioral health care manager and um, this consultant psychiatrist, and the patient. The patient's the center of the team. And in our little diagram, I will go forward to show you that. 
There's our little diagram, uh, which everyone who's ever had an aim center contact has seen. Um, patients in the middle, trying to, we're trying to do things the way it works for the patient. And an example of this is somebody comes in, let's just say, and they've got depression. And we say, uh, you know, there's a couple ways of treating depression. There's psychotherapy, there's medication, there's both together. What works for you? And if the patient says, sometimes patients say, I want to talk about what's bothering me. I want to get to the, you know, bottom of it or do whatever it needs I need to talk about to get better. And don't, don't try and give me all that goofy medication. Or the patient will say, I don't, don't bother me with that chit chat. I want the real treatment. I need a pill. Good, all good. Both are effective ways of approaching. And you know the, the evidence shows that if you provide treatment in a patient in a way that the patient is expecting or believes to be useful, that's more likely to be useful. So fine. Um, and so we do that and then we and then we see how it works. If it doesn't, if it works, great. And if it doesn't work, then maybe we try doing it a different way. Um, but the point is that the, you know, the patient is driving decision making. Second, second principle, population based. And I talked about this. You have a population of people. Let's say it's the all the people in your primary care practice. Let's say it's all the people covered by a, um, you know some kind of uh, population entity. Um, you you um, follow them. You read. You follow the people in your practice. You follow the people you're taking care of and you measure how they're doing and you make sure you, they're not slipping through the cracks. You make sure they're getting better. And if you're not, they're not getting better, you're gonna do something. Moving on to the next principle, using measurement-based treatment to target. You, you apply a treatment, be it psychotherapeutic, be it um, medication, be it something else, sometimes environmental manipulation of one kind or another. Um, and, uh, and then you see how it goes. And, and if it's not responding, you don't say, well, let's just do more of the same and wait till it works. You change your treatment and you try something different. Um, and the treatments you use are evidence-based treatment. You don't make it up. You don't, you don't, you use stuff that's been shown to work. And if you do all these things, it's likely that you might be able to be accountable to the patient and to other team members for quality of care and clinical outcomes. And in some ways, financially accountable. You know, ide ideally, if you do these things, you should be able to demonstrate that uh, this, is a, this is a valuable, in the sense of value, um, way of, do, of doing practice. Um, so I'm going to bump ahead and talk a little bit about, um, I've talked about most, mostly what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about a few basic ideas. We've talked about what the primary care provider does. Uh, and I focus on the primary treatment relationship. That's so, so, so important. And when we train teams, we make sure that they understand how important that is and how important the language they use when they talk about the program is that, that they're, they express confidence um, in, the, in the program. And that makes, that makes a huge difference. And of course, they have the role in prescribing and monitoring um, the treatment. The behavioral health care manager uh, this is a this is a behavioral health provider. It can be a social worker, it can be an RN, it can be a psychologist, and it can also be an unlicensed person. Um, can be trained to do this, and because there's a shortage these days of licensable mental health providers, there's work being done on figuring out how to train up people to do effectively this kind of work in more of a certificate approach. And that's more of that is to come. There's just no two ways about it. There's just needs to be more people to do this kind of work. And this person has a lot to do, both tracking, keeping track of how people are doing, reaching out to people who aren't um, coming in, provide, uh, perform, performing uh, assessments, tracking response, interacting with the primary care provider, and also the provision of therapeutic interventions, such as behavior activation, problem solving treatment, et cetera. Psych the role of the psychiatric consultant is to review cases with the care manager, usually weekly. In fact, I was just doing this uh, right before this call. Um, and also to be available for urgent consultation. This doesn't happen that often, but it does, it does happen. Um, should, should it be needed for the primary care provider or the, um, or the, uh, the behavioral health care manager? Um, in addition, a good psychiatric consultant can, can provide lots of other support to the practice in terms of setting up protocols for addressing. Sometimes, for example, 
uh, primary care provider will say, I need to know how to like do the first couple rounds of antidepressant treatment, and then I can come talk to you if it's not working out. And you know, for example, I've written that up. I've written up approaches for the clinic to patients with ADHD or to bipolar disorder. And that can be that kind of thing can be real useful. And I think a good psychiatric consultant will make it his or her business to figure out how to help things run better in that clinic. Um, in terms of a psychiatric consultant, one of the things about the psychiatric consultant is it's this tremendous, it represents a tremendous ramping up, a tremendous augmentation of the usefulness and the range of uh, psychiatric expertise. And so in the time, you, we think that you can probably assist with the care of almost 10 times as many patients in a given time period. Um, being a psychiatric consultant and a collaborative care team, as you did if seeing the patients face to face, and um, you know, here's a set, here's a situation where you have um, a, a um, psychiatric consultant with three different care managers, um, each of each of whom is managing 50 to 80 patients, and in three hours a week, you're you're actively at really actively managing um, this this caseload, um, and this is a this is really one of the core ways that you improve psychiatric access. Um, and we continue to try and figure out ways to, to ramp this up and, and to get people seen. We've talked about population-based care and the, and the use of registries. I will jump ahead. Um, in terms of treatment to target, now this is treatment to target reflects you know, measurement. And if people aren't getting well, doing something to move toward getting them to a treatment target, like for example, a BHQ under 10 or five or something. This is da data from Mayo, amazing data from Mayo, where they did a huge program um, in uh, their outpatient clinics in Wisconsin and Minnesota over a number of years. And this is what they found. Um, it, 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 it beggars uh, belief. People in the collaborative care program uh, moved to um, remission on average in 86 days. That's, that's three months. Um, and um, getting somebody to remission for depression in three months is pretty darn good when you think about how long it takes generally for people to get better. Um, usual care is usual in primary care in their Mayo Clinic clinics, 614 days. So can you imagine somebody walks in and you say, you know, you have this depression, but we'll treat you here in primary care because we, we do that. And probably in about almost two years, you should be, uh, you have a pretty good chance of putting in remission. As opposed to as opposed to 86 days, it's just astonishing. And I think what it does is it brings into high relief the idea that putting in place a, a focused program like this makes a huge difference in actually getting people better. A year's worth of depression is a year lost. We talked about evidence-based treatment. I will just move ahead with this. Um, okay, these days, telemedicine-based behavioral health treatment. Short version, it works. It works just as well. Um, this the, the evidence for this goes way back, um, way, way, way pre-COVID. Um, much of this uh, was done by uh, John Fortney, who's now at UW, but it, when he did most of this was in Arkansas, University of Arkansas. And um, a bunch of a bunch of telemedicine based uh, programs in rural areas, because that's all they could do, um, were, were very effective. Um, this is another, this is a different visual representation of the same kind of thing where the, the um, interaction with patients, uh, th this is, this is a model where here, here's a clinic, here's a clinic, here's, a, I mean, here's a clinic, here's a clinic, here's a clinic, and the behavioral health team is centrally located and weighs in by phone, uh, or video these days with, uh, with the patient. This works too. So. So there's virtual teams. We talked about that. Telephone is not so great, just in general. Um, but you know, if that's all you got, that's all you got. Uh, the usefulness of shared medical records has really transformed um, the, the work of the psychiatric consultant in particular. I worked uh, without access to an ENMR for much of my career doing this. And when you can actually see the epic, it just makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, okay, we are right on time at uh, the next poll. Yes, so Dr. Kern, 
Briefly, I just want to say thank you for such an enlightening presentation. It was particularly interesting to hear you speak on who gets treatment and the percentages of patients that are actually touched by mental health providers. And also it was so helpful to see the data comparing health outcomes, patient satisfaction and provider satisfaction in usual versus collaborative care settings. So throughout the presentation, we received quite a few questions but before jumping in, everyone, if you could just answer the brief poll that is on your screen now. And as soon as we get some answers um, on that, we can move forward. If you have questions, please drop them in the chat and we will begin with the questions that we've already received in just a second once we have uh, the poll closed out. Thank you. And also, if you would like to message me or the panelists directly with your questions, just let us know. And, you know, again, we'll read those out for everyone so that they can benefit from the answers. Okay. It looks like we are wrapped up with the polling. So I will pull up a few questions that we have. Dr. Kern, are you ready for a Q&A? Do you want to move to the next slide? I think it's just- I a... am ready. Oh, I thought we were going to have the poll results. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Questions. So, My favorite what... part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mine too. We learned so much from questions. So first question, can you address the integration of substance use disorder into a primary care practice versus collaboration with a substance use disorder provider as a partner? Um, so, of interest, um, University of Washington is actually in the middle of a large um, multi-center study studying um, approaches to opioid use disorder treatment, specifically using a collaborative care model and whether a, a, a somewhat tweaked uh, model that includes a, a measurement of uh, treatment status for opioid use disorder will be better than than collaborative care as usual. Um, so that's that's on our that's definitely on our radar. We're definitely working on it. Um, so the question is, if you if you bring it in house, if you bring the substance use disorder treatment in house versus you have somebody down the street or next door or somewhere who will take this particular oopsie that was me uh, will take this particular problem on. What would be the difference? I think that's a. I think the answer to that is it depends on the local circumstances. So if you have, for example, an awesome substance abuse disorder organization in your community that you have a relationship with, or better yet, that's part of your um, treatment, uh, your treatment organization. Great, do that. If you have no such thing. You may want to think about how can we bring this in house. I would say that as at present, there's no evidence to suggest one is better than the other. And I think that even if there was, if somebody did a study and they'd say, well, in our hands, X was better than Y, um, it would still be highly dependent on local conditions, local people, local programs. Um, and so I would, if I was designing a program, I, that's probably what I would be thinking about most rather than which is, which is better. Thank you, Dr. Kern. Mm -hmm. Let me move on to our next question. So the next question is, is this, and I assume this means a collaborative care model, and Tammy, if you're still on, correct me if I'm wrong, is this utilized in adult and child primary care settings more or less, and does implementation vary for pediatric populations? Okay, I'm looking at Tammy's question. Uh, she said more or less equally. Um, and so the, the answer is no, it has not been equal. This is a this is a model that was developed in adults. And in fact, the initial um, impact study was done in geriatric adults. Um, so so the uh, the use in children is still kind of being in being felt out. Um, the, uh, there are, but of course, when you when you work in a if you work in a primary care clinic, kids come in all the time uh, with all of the kinds of problems that kids uh, come in with. Some programs say, "Well, we don't coo kids," <laughs> but I've, I've never found that helpful. I don't think that it's useful for a collaborative care program to say, "We do this, we don't do that." At the very least, it's, this is my belief 
um, that at the very least the collaborative care team weighs in, you know, assesses. I figure without without any insult intended to anyone, we probably know more about even the parts of behavioral health that we don't know that much about than the primary care team does. So we can at least like take a look, see, and, and make some recommendations about, for example, referral or what to do next. That said, um, we have been, uh, we're finishing up a two or three year um, project in the Seattle area in partnership with Seattle Children's Hospital, uh, Department of Psychiatry, um, where there are pediatric clinics using different approaches to doing collaborative care in pediatrics. And we are developing, it's not ready yet, but we're developing a toolkit um, for the use of pediatric practices that are interested in learning to do this. And what we, you know, when we when we talk about um, adult collaborative care, we're, we're quite prescriptive. We say, this is better than that. You darn well better use a registry. And you have to have a psychiatric consultant or it's not gonna work. And here's the evidence, here are the 10 studies that say so. Um, in, in, chi in, uh, in the care of children, it's not like that. There isn't that body of research. And it's, it's just happening now. It's just being done now. And so our toolkit, um, basically what it reflects is our best knowledge of that relatively limited um, literature, as well as information from people around the country, both in Seattle and, and all over the country, who are doing this kind of work and what they have been doing, the kind of problems they run into, the kind of solutions they have tried, uh, what their what their experience has been. Some of them have been successful. Some of them have closed, and so that's good information too. You know, don't do that. Um, or, or you know, maybe they were face to face with certain funding arrangements or in, uh, institutional support arrangements that weren't robust enough. Or the, the list goes on. The point being that at this point, um, you know, rather than uh, Evidence-based practice. We have a fair bit of practice-based evidence, and we're we're just we're we're still getting our feet and learning how to do it. And the idea of the toolkit was to to share that as much as we could to uh, to accelerate or to facilitate the process of getting that information spread around, um, so that it's not siloed and living in this little pocket. So if you're in Michigan or Chicago or North Carolina, you don't know what happened in Seattle. Awesome, thank you. So our next question has has there ever been any thought of a reversed a reverse model where behavioral health settings integrate physical health treatment or even just screening and closed loop referral to a physical health provider? Absolutely. So I, I've been working so my prior life was as a uh, community mental health center medical director. And I became and actually I was interested in that first. And um, we were trying to figure out how we were going to start monitoring and linking with medical care for our folks with severe and persistent mental illness uh, who were having these god awful outcomes dying 25 years um, sooner than a matched population. Um, and so this is exactly what we had in mind. And the way I got involved with collaborative care to begin with is I went to a local primary care organization and said, will you help me? Will you? Well, you see my folks with schizophrenia who are having all these medical problems. They said, yeah, but you have to help us with your, our mental health difficulties. And I'm like, okay, how do you do that? I didn't know. And so this was, this was the beginning of a, of, a, of a second career doing that. But the, uh, there's been fairly widespread uptake in the community mental health world, community mental health world with what you would just, what they call reverse integration. For, there's no standard term for this, but reverse integration is one of them. And this has a lot of this, I'm gonna go back. A lot of this has been organized around and through and by the Center of Excellence for Integrated Health Solutions of the um, um, National Council. It says here, National Council for Behavioral Health. They're now the National Council for Mental Wellness. Um, but that's uh, that's a, a, a vigorous area of work, and uh, it's challenging. It's challenging, you know. We've been we've had these programs in place now for 15 years, and it turns out it's harder to move the dial on getting folks with serious mental illness healthy than you might think. So, definitely, I agree with that. 
So moving on to our next question, um, who hires and supervises care managers? Or in your experience, who has provided that function? That can happen a number of ways. Uh, when I was setting up collaborative care programs, I hired them and I supervised them. But that's not that's not ordinary um, for the it's not ordinary for the director of the program to be a psychiatrist. Um, usually, it's a clinic supervisor, it's a clinic executive director, it's somebody like that. And often, depending on the size of the organization, for example, in a relatively small primary care clinic, you know, it, it might be the medical director, it might be the clinic manager. Um, it's since in a somewhat larger organization, there might be a behavioral health leader, um, a behavioral health director. Uh, they, and they would hire and supervise the care managers. Um, so, so it it varies. Um, it can be done a number of different ways. Um, I think that it's not so important what the title of the person is so much as what their level of investment and interest and knowledge um, about what's called for, what needs to be done, what good practice looks like, what bad performance looks like. Um, so there, there's lots of ways. There's lots of ways to solve that particular problem, and it's you know it's you know it's like what they say about hiring for attitude. It's a little bit like that. You want the you want the person doing it who's interested in and excited about doing it. If you can find such a person, um, because that's what's going to be needed. Right. Thank you so much. So we have a few questions related to billing. Um, someone that's interested in learning more about the billing structure for this model and the FQHC setting, and if time spent by the behavioral health coordinator is a billable service. And then also just kind of want to lump in there, um, has there been any evidence of cost savings associated with the model? <clears throat> so the billing structure for um, collaborative care, um, there has been the um, implementation of an array of CPT codes um, for collaborative care services. They're structured in the same way as uh, chronic care uh, chronic care management codes in primary care are structured. So in essence, if you have all of the if you have all of the elements of a collaborative care team, if you have a psychiatric consultant, if you have regular meetings, if you gather data, um, then um, you you keep track of how much time the care manager is spending for a given patient on care management activities. And then at the end of the month, that gets billed. And depending on how many minutes it is, it's a different code and it's a different payment. Um, that's a little wonky. Um, it wasn't intended that this was going to be a permanent state of affairs. And that the expectation had been, we, we would have hoped years ago when this was first getting developed, that at this point we would be in a situation where most of this kind of care would be capitated, but it isn't yet. And so, but but this form of Billing exists and it can be done enough to support the practice. Um, specifically, I saw that I saw the question. There was also the question about FQHC. Um, in FQHCs, often you don't do that whole nine yards with um, the collaborative care model because the prospective payment rate for a mental health clinician encounter is pays better than what you would get if you took that same activity and build the collaborative care codes. So um, in, 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 though it, there are codes for billing collaborative care in fairly qualified health centers, often it's not done because you lose money. <laughs> uh, and that was an unfortunate, that's a long story, but that's kind of, that's the state of affairs with FQHC. So for example, in the FQHC that I founded, um, that's how they do it. Thank you. That's really helpful, especially in regards to the PPS rate and, and losing out on, on money for billing for those codes. Um, so moving on, our next question is, um, do you have any experience or any insight into collaborative treatment of homeless persons with, uh, MHBH disorders, mental health, behavioral health disorders? Um, and do you have any insight into the composition of um, the team and locations for treatment? Um, I think that um, the the collaborative the the thing about the collaborative care model, first of all, is that it was initially 
kind of dreamed up by a group of psychiatrists who are used to working in medical settings and thought maybe we could figure out a way to get some people with depression better. So they did that. And those people with depression, they were old people and they were, they were geriatric psychiatrists. So they said, oh, we'll do it with our usual people that we see who are old, old depressed people. And that worked out pretty well. And then what's happened with collaborative care since then is taken this model and sort of expanding it to meet all kinds of different populations that it wasn't initially designed to take care of at all. And the weird thing has been that often it does work, you know, so the bipolar folks and the PTSD and the ADHD and, um, it, it, you know, works for them too. And so who knew? But it wasn't set up, for example, to be, to be, um, to be a way of taking care of, for example, a homeless, severely mentally ill population. Now, for sure it wasn't. Now, there are places, including my old shop, where we see a lot of those folks. So, for example, the uh, again, the FQ that I set up in, in Northwest Indiana uh, was next door to the homeless shelter. And, um, and, and next door to the, you know, the public housing. And so we see lots of people who are homeless because we're the provider of last resort. Um, but I don't think, and, and so what we often do is try and link them up with the more comprehensive recovery-based services of our community mental health center. Um, so I would say that the, from in most settings, um, at in most settings at most, the, the usefulness or the approach of a collaborative care team would be to engage with, to assess, and to find the right place for caring for somebody like that. That said, there, like I said, when I was talking about bipolar disorder, lots of people get used to us. They feel they get good care, which they do. And um, they come back and they come back and they say, you know, you sent me to the mental health center, but I like it here better. Happens all the time. And so, so that's nice. That's kind of a compliment. But, you know, if for, uh, you know, if it was my loved one, I would probably want them to be in a place where they could get linked up with housing support and, and uh, you know, medical linkage and um, all the sorts of things you need to have, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, a recovery experience that will stick and be of uh, value. Thank you. So our next Question statement is many states now have free consultation services provided by psychiatrists to pediatric providers. Not the full model talked about today, but a variation of the theme. Will there be a coordination between your group's efforts and what many states have been doing for many years? Yeah, so these um, these um, phone model um, pediatric um, psychi psychiatrist consultation models are very cool. And they have been very successful in a number of states. I'm very familiar with the one in um, Massachusetts. And uh, Seattle Children's runs a wonderful statewide service um, that we, we recently expanded to adults, too. So now there's a pediatric version. There's an adult version. And any provider anywhere in the state um, can call anytime and, and get consultation. And that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, so that's that's good, but what it doesn't do is sort of, you know, what it does do is like solve a problem for a, for example, a primary care provider who doesn't know what to do with one patient at one time. What it doesn't do well is organize and carry out the structured and predictable and evidence-based approach to a pop a, a larger population of folks. Um, and so there are lots of places like like in Seattle where both of those things are happening at the same time. And there is some, there is some overlap. If you're a primary care provider and you have a collaborative care program in your shop, you might, you know, in a pinch call up the psychi the uh, the um, pediatric phone line, the bat phone for for uh, pediatric psychiatry. Um, 
by way, so in terms of coordination, I can, again, I can speak to Washington. Everybody knows everybody. And, um, you know, in some places there are, there are, for example, psychiatrists who do both. Um, so that's, the, I would say that's kind of the level of coordination at this point. Uh, they, they, you know, they really, they're for different things, but related different things. Okay, and along uh, a, similar, a similar vein to that, um, there is a question about whether or not you're familiar with the pediatric mental health care access program that's offered for free at the state level to pediatric primary care providers. And if they're, if you're aware of a similar model for adults. I mean, that's- I'm problem. not aware of that. Okay. So it just goes to show you, um, you're always learning something. Um, so yeah, so short answer, no. Long answer, I'm going to look into it when I when I hang up. Right, and thank you to Laura for bringing that to our attention and for sharing the link so that we can... Oh, she thinks it's... It the, looks like it's the model you just referenced, okay. Oh, it's the teleconsultation model? Oh, yeah, so it is, so it is. Okay, okay well, I did, I did recognize that. the tag. And I think the only other question that I have remaining is... Um, you know, following the development of the toolkit that you mentioned. Yeah. So what's the question? How can... How can it be accessed? The it's not finished yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I don't quite know how... I don't quite know how the, how it's going to be promulgated or what the timetable would be. The, the AIM Center is scrupulous about making sure that things we put out uh, our, um, what's the right word, um, are what they say they are. And that if we say in a toolkit, the evidence says blah, 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 that it in fact does say that, and that the language is clear. And so they're, we work very hard to make sure they're um, of the very high quality. So that takes a long time. So I don't actually know. I don't actually know when it's coming out. Um, I would, I would uh, for everybody, strongly recommend if you're interested in collaborative care to go to the AIM Center website. Um, I'm not I'm not shilling this. I used to do the same thing before I was hired by the AIM Center. And but it's it's the place to go for for um, reliable information about the collaborative care model and related issues about you know the evidence base about training about um, um, sometimes for useful documents for supporting the work. And that's at aims.uw.edu. Um, or you could just Google AIM Center and get the same place. Thank you, Dr. Kern. One oh, there it is. Oh, yep, it's in the chat. <laughs> yeah, one final when you question. forget that, just write AIM Center. You know. one, one final question for you. Are there any certifications related to collaborative care? Are you aware? Not of yet. But that's probably coming. Uh, in Washington, they've gotten um, approval from the legislature to for a certification uh, for a. I forget what they. You know, forgive me. It's like a behavioral care manager technician. It's not. That's not right. That's not the right title. But it, that's what it amounts to. And basically, it's a bachelor's prepared person who's gotten this specific focus training to function in the behavioral care management role, and that's that's just getting underway now. Um, but this is coming, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm actually a big fan of this. I think it should be coming. We need people who can do effective work, and if we if we wanted to roll this out enough to make a significant difference in access, we wouldn't have enough provider. We wouldn't have enough anybody, but we would, certainly wouldn't have enough if you were depending on, for example, licensable, masters prepared therapists and above. They're not there. They don't exist. And so you're, and so these problems, these programs get stunted. And I don't know how many. You got me on my soapbox here. I don't know how many, especially mental health programs, have been really stunted. Like grants are, I'm familiar with high-powered organizations, and they get a, offered a big grant to do a great, awesome program, and they can't take the five million dollars because they don't have anybody to put it in. They don't have any technicians. They don't have any therapists. They're not available in that, whatever that place is. 
Um, and I don't think that it's, uh, I think that's happening quite a lot. So the idea about a certificate program for, for example, bachelor's level prepared folks to be a behavioral health care manager is a step toward making a an effectively prepared workforce that's non-traditional. So people are going to be like, oh, you can't have bachelor's people doing this kind of independent practice. Well, it's that or nothing. So. Right. So everyone. And that's, and that's kind of the collaborative care story in a way. People go like, oh, why can't we just do old fashioned psychiatry like we did in the good old days? Well, like, who's going to do that? So I forgive me. Forgive me. I started raising my voice there. No, you're you're totally fine. We appreciate all of your insights. Um, everyone, we have about six minutes left. Um, so if we have any additional questions um, or anything, just please drop it in the chat. Um, <laughs> I see some, some great comments there in the chat. Yes, thank you so much. Um, okay, Dr. Kern, do you wanna move to the next slide for me? There's a next slide? There is a next yeah, slide. There is. Oh. Yes. So I do just want to highlight these upcoming events for everyone. Um, sorry, 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 that was me. It's okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. So please just take a look at these. If you're interested, if you're available, the registration links are here. Um, please keep in mind that the tip sheets that I highlighted at the beginning of this presentation um, will be included. You'll get these slides, you'll get the recording. So you'll be able to click on those links go to the tip sheets, you'll be able to access previous recordings. And then also um, you will have, you know, the links to register for these upcoming COE events. So we're definitely excited about these and, and hope that you're interested and able to join. And then if you hop to the next slide, Dr. Kern. And this is just my contact information. If anyone has any questions for us, um, please let us know, please email me, reach out. Um, we love getting your feedback for sure. And I don't think there is a next slide, but just we can see. There is not. Okay. All right. This is the last slide. So I don't see any questions. It looks like we've covered all of the things. Dr. Kern, this has been great. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights with us, your knowledge with us. Um, it's greatly appreciated and definitely something for us to think about as, as this process evolves. And it looks like everyone in the chat is sounding off that they are grateful for the presentation as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Kern. My pleasure. Good luck, everybody. Bye, everyone. I hope you have a great day.